Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. In previous weeks, we've talked about the Rookie of the Year candidates and candidates for MVP, but what about Coach of the Year, Tom, based on the final standings there in the NFL? Well, we watched uh, Don Coriel's team, uh, the Cardinals, come back and get in the playoffs. 10-4, uh, and four, that's a heck of a year uh, for the second-year coach with St. Louis. How about a guy like Rick Forzano, who brought the Lions back under very, very adverse circumstances? And really had them playing very competitively all year once he took over. And, of course, Charlie Winner, right? right? Closed with six straight wins, right? But you really can't forget about Don Shula, can you? Because he had a tough job this year. Well, I think he's had uh, the star syndrome move in on the Dolphins, and Shula might be doing the outstanding job in football. And how about the old man, Sid Gilman? Well, you, he deserves a lot of credit, no, no question about it. We can make a vote on about six <laughs> or seven That's guys. True. Right? We'll be right back with This Week in the NFL after this message. After a faltering start, George Allen's vintage Redskins have presented Washington, D.C. area residents with a heady problem of how to celebrate still another successful season in bigger and better ways. With the playoffs in the bag, Washington Redskins fans celebrated the remarkable vigor of their over-the-hill guys in a big way. But for Chicago Bear backers, the 1974 season is memorable only for an extraordinary number of plays like this one, which rendered the Bears' offense its own worst enemy. Last Sunday in RFK Stadium in Washington, the Bears had more trouble on their hands than just an inept offense. Because number nine, Slick Adolph, was back under center for the first time in a month. And the Redskin attack quickly purred to peak efficiency under the Masters' touch. Larry Brown bolted over twice with tough runs after Jurgensen moved the ball close with his passes. And Sonny got a hand from Charlie Taylor, increasing his totals to 14 out of 22 for 205 yards and one TD. And a 21-0 advantage at halftime. When he sat down, giving Joe Theismann and Dwayne Thomas time to strut their stuff. Dwayne Thomas, number 47, strode smoothly over 100 yards and eight carries, with 66 of those yards coming on this play. Joe Theismann hit six of seven passes for 123 yards and one touchdown. All in all, the second half was a carbon copy of the first, with only some names and numbers changed to protect the Chicago Bears. As Washington ripped to an impressive 42 to nothing victory, and appeared to be peaking in all facets of play just as George Allen would have it, right before the playoffs. Well, Pat, the St. Louis Cardinals were trailing the New York Giants at halftime 14-zip when they got the news the Redskins were clobbering the Bears. The choice was real simple from that point on, Tom. The next half would decide whether or not they would back into the divisional playoffs as the wild card team, or go there as the undisputed champions of the NFC East. The Cardinals have lost four of their last six games, and in the first half, the Giants looked as though they were going to make it five of seven. Characteristically, the Cardinals weren't getting beaten as much as they were beating themselves, and typically enough, the problem was concentration. Meanwhile, the Giants, led by quarterback Craig Morton, were closing in for first blood with this pass to Ray Rhodes. From
From the two, Ron Johnson butted in, and it was Giants seven, cards nothing. A few drop passes later, and the Giants were in business again, thanks to a field-shortening return by the multi-purpose Mr. Rhodes. Five plays later, it was Giants 14, NFC playoff team zero, and St. Louis's mistakes seemed like they could almost go on forever. At the very threshold of their first divisional title, the St. Louis Cardinals were then faced with whether they had the championship poise to ignore their frustrations and play a winning second half. The answer was not long in coming, however, as with Jim Hart orchestrating, the Cardinals commenced a comeback. Once at the giant four yard line, Mr. Hart decided not to pass to his primary receiver, then checked off to number 20, Ken Willard, whose catch made it card six, Giants 14. But the deficit was quickly made up as an interception turned the ball over, and Jim Hart only needed one throw to number 81, Jackie Smith, for the touch. On the following series, the defense came up with interception number two. And by that time, everyone was turned on, especially number 21, Terry Metcalf. And as the third quarter ended, miraculous Mr. Metcalf was in the end zone. And 20 St. Louis points were suddenly on the scoreboard. At the beginning of the fourth quarter, the St. Louis defense capped a brilliant fourth consecutive series blitz of the Giants when number 67 Larry Stallings came down with a Craig Morton pass, then alertly handed off to number 43 Norm Thompson, who set up the final Cardinal touchdown. Terry Metcalf strode into the giant end zone to complete the 26 to 14 victory. The St. Louis Cardinals had won themselves their first divisional title in 26 years. Last Sunday at Veterans Stadium, the Philadelphia Eagles were trying to achieve their best record since 1966. Two men have shouldered the burden for the Eagles in 1974. One is all-pro tight end Charlie Young, and the other is all-pro middle linebacker Bill Berge, the soul of the Eagles' scrape defense. Many observers thought the Eagles paid too dear a price for Bill Berge when they acquired him from the Bengals, but two number one draft choices seems a cheap price for a middle linebacker who will stand his ground for man or beast. Against the resurgent Lions, Berge and his brawlers demonstrated the infectious hitting that has become expected in Philadelphia. Rookie quarterback Mike Barilla started his third straight game, but his offense started sluggishly due to some Lion defensive crunch. But Cool Mike took charge, and the Eagles built a 17-3 lead when Barilla found his Eiffel towering end, Harold Carmichael, running a post-corner pattern.
From there, it got worse for Detroit as the rookie Barilla shredded their coverages like a veteran. Barilla's poise under fire was never more evident when he looked right, then quickly selected secondary receiver Harold Carmichael for six more. But for the third time in two weeks, a Barilla touchdown was voided by a penalty. Fortunately, Barilla seems to thrive on adversity, and his touchdown to Charles Young built an insurmountable Eagle lead. Charlie Young's seven receptions made him the leading receiver in the NFC, and his two-year total broke Mike Dicta's record for a tight end. Not bad stats for a player in only his second year. The Lions failed to achieve their goal, an eight and six record, because their receivers rarely cracked Philadelphia's well-covered zone defense. Quarterback Greg Landry scored the first Lion touchdown and accounted for the last with a scoring shot to run Jesse. But it was too late for Detroit as they rolled snake eyes and lost to Philadelphia 28 to 17. In recent years, the emphasis on winning in professional sports has come under much criticism from writers and fans. But I wonder if it isn't the critics themselves and not the coaches or players who are the most ruthless, Tom. Well, Pat, sometimes I think so. When you, when you look at a situation like last week in Atlanta where almost 50,000 ticket holders avoided the Falcons-Packers game, you have to wonder if those Fairweather fans are really interested in the game of pro football or maybe just fascinated by the final scores. A very few of the Falcons faithful turned out on this dank gray final Sunday of the 1974 season. And on the Packers' opening drive, they witnessed the longest offensive play of the game. John Hadle hit Rich McGeorge for 29 yards. But a fumble still this drive on the very next play. The Green Bay had to wait until the third quarter before causing a flicker on the scoreboard when Eric Torkelson broke away on this 21-yard run, which set up a three-pointer by Chester Marco. For the remainder of the afternoon, Green Bay was stymied by a very effective Atlanta defense with plays like this by number 34, Ray Brown. But neither could a season-long impotent Atlanta attack generate any heat. Stayed out in the cold as defense reigned. And one touchdown scored by Atlanta's Dave Hampton in the first quarter was enough to win this game as the Atlanta Falcons bumped the Green Bay Packers at the end of a disappointing season for both clubs. Final, Green Bay 3, Atlanta 10. Well, second place in the NFC West was not the most coveted trophy up for grabs in the NFL this year. But last week in San Francisco, the 49ers and the New Orleans Saints went after the less than prestigious position in a game that offered a fast and furious finale. The San Francisco 49ers have been forced to go with young and inexperienced quarterbacks for most of the 74 season. Even so, sometimes their success has been excellent, as it was last week against the Saints. Early in the game, rookie signal caller Tom Owen, number 14, established his ground attack with slithering runs by the likes of number 48, Sammy Johnson. Once he got his 49ers in close, Owen went to Larry Schreiber for this touchdown and an early lead. Then it was razzle-dazzle time, which ended with Danny Abramowitz passing to Gene Washington, whose spectacular catch led to another Schreiber short score. Mm -hmm. 
Washington's performance early in the second quarter was the last of the action until a wild and wooly fourth period. Tom Owen opened the last period with a whistling 17-yard strike to Washington, and the 49ers led 21-7. Scant seconds later, New Orleans quarterback Larry Saipa, number 13, was hit by Cedric Hardman and fumbled. An alert Bill Belk ran it in for a 28-7 San Francisco Bulls. Saipa's luck continued to run sour thanks to the efforts of number 53, Tommy Hart, and it was time for a replacement. Number 12, Bobby Scott came in and the Saints began marching. After much hesitation, Scott hit tight end Paul Seal for a score. Shortly thereafter, it was Scott again, this time to number 41, Bob Newland, whose great catch made it 28-21. But Scott went up top once too often, and number 64, Dave Wilcox, made him pay with an interception and touchdown that closed out the 49ers' second place. NFC West finished 35 to 21. Both the Rams and Bills finished up their season last week knowing they had a playoff berth cinch, Pat, and you have to maybe think their game may not have been a, a true test of their relative abilities. Well, the only argument I have for that statement, Tom, is that I think most teams like to have a win under their belts prior to their first playoff game, so perhaps both the Bills and the Rams wanted last week's victory more than you'd imagine. Only in Los Angeles would a fire hydrant come to the game disguised as a fluorescent frisbee. And the Buffalo Bills came in the guise of a playoff team, but didn't look like it. In fact, even O.J. got squeezed repeatedly by the Rams' crunching defense. And while Jack the Hacksaw Reynolds took a breather, he was exhorted on to even greater acts of disruption. But the Bills decided there was time for a little disruption of their own, and they kept the Harris-Jackson combo out of the end zone. Finally, O.J. Simpson found a novel way to fool the Rams' defense. His running pop-up was covered by number 27, Ahmad Rashad, and the Bills led 7 to nothing. It wasn't until the third quarter that Harris found the range and began to connect with the likes of Lance Rinsel, number 19. But once Harris got going, he got tough, hitting Rob Scribner to put the Rams up seven to six. Then after another power drive, Harris rolled around in and made the score 13 to seven. And Ron Jaworski later added another one yard score to make it 19 to seven. The Bills tried gamely to come back and a big play from Joe Ferguson to J.D. Hill accounted for 55 yards and another Buffalo touchdown, but the Easterners fell short 19 to 14. And thanks to the Rams' fine 10 and four season, the Coliseum Seagulls will get at least another week's diet of half-eaten hot dogs. Last Sunday, the Denver Broncos traveled to San Diego, Pat, to close out their season with an expected win over the Chargers. But as you know, Tom, they ran into a surprising Tommy Prothrow team and were never really in the game at all. With the ink still wet on a new five-year contract, John Ralston hoped his Broncos would ensure their best record ever with a victory over the semi-rejuvenated San Diego Chargers. But like their coach, the Broncos seemed unable to run at full speed, with one exception. 
Otis Armstrong, number 24, continued his phenomenal year as he gained 142 yards to pump his league-leading rushing total to 1,407 yards. Armstrong's running was the only bright light on an otherwise dismal day for the Broncos as they succumbed to an inspired Charger team 17 to nothing. Quarterback by Jesse Freitas, the Charger offense had little trouble moving the football. As has become the custom in San Diego, the offensive attack was led by a rookie sensation Don Woods, number 33. Woods gained 105 yards against the Broncos to become the Chargers' all-time single-season rushing leader. And his 1,161 yards for the year marked the highest rushing total ever by a rookie in the National Football League. With this convincing victory, the Chargers could look back on their first season under Tommy Prothrow with the satisfaction that they had performed better than expected and had wrapped up the year not with a whimper, but with a bang. Last Saturday night, the Dallas Cowboys finished a most unusual schedule. Unusual because it consisted of only 14 games this year, Tom. That's right. For the first time in nine years, the Cowboys will be able to watch all the playoff games on television. Instead of participating in at least one or more, and their finale with Oakland was sort of symbolic of their season in general. Last week, the Raiders dusted off some of their big guns when the Cowboys came to town. But Roger Staubach's cannon roared first on a ricochet shot to Walt Garrison to Drew Pearson in the end zone. Then the Dallas defense boomed in on Oakland punter Ray Guy when he bobbled a snap in the end zone and the Cowboys led 9-3. Up from his bench spot, where he's been resting since Oakland clinched, came Ken Stabler, who fired fingertip high to Fred Bolitnikoff in the end zone. And then just before halftime, the snake struck with Dallas poison to 23, Charlie Smith, and Oakland led 16 to 9. Early in the second half, a Dallas fumble was picked up by linebacker Phil Villapiano, number 41. And what to our wondering eyes should appear but a quarter century of pro football history wearing number 16 and the name Blanda. On his first play, the 47-year-old wonder man dropped back, reared back, and fired a touchdown to Cliff Branch wearing number 21 and 21 years George's junior. And all of Oakland stood and cheered the amazing career of their ageless idol, who has been named the NFL's Man of the Year for 1974. With the game seemingly out of reach, the Cowboys flared to life. Staubach hit on a shot to Drew Pearson, whose great second effort ignited and inspired Dallas. Once again, the Dallas defense took its cue when, with his back to his own goal, Larry Lawrence uncorked a pass that popped to Leroy Jordan, and the old cowpoke ran it to the one from where Doug Dennison punched it in. Threatening again later, Staubach went to number 83, Golden Richards, 
whose acrobatic catch made it an easy two-yard dive for Dennison to cut the Raider lead to 27-23. But that was the final as the Dallas rally fell short just as their season had, and the Cowboys went home to watch the Raiders on TV. Despite a pair of record-breaking performances by the Baltimore Colts last Sunday, the Joe Namath-led Jets prevailed to register their sixth straight victory and finish the season with a come-from-behind 7-7 seven and seven record. If it is true that Joe Namath was playing his final game as a Jet last Sunday, he certainly bowed out with a fine performance. For as usual, Joe Woolley was responsible for a whole lot of offense, including this 25-yard touchdown to number 83, Jerome Barkham. But Joe's Colt counterpart, Burt Jones, was no slouch either as he pinpointed receivers all afternoon. As the second quarter began, Mr. Jones tied it up 7-all with this flip to league-leading receiver number 26, Lydell Mitchell. But then Joe and the Jets got down to business. And one heave later, Jerome Barkham was seated deep in Colt territory. From the one, John Riggins launched himself into the Colt end zone for his first of two scores. Following Riggins' second touchdown dive, Burt Jones threw a desperation pass that number 51, Ralph Baker, deflected, and number 22, Burgess Owens, intercepted. Thirty yards later, it was Jets 28 and Colts 7, and any way you looked at it, the route was underway. But in the third quarter, Burt Jones continued a completion string of six straight with a bomb to number 86, Freddie Scott, a rookie from Amherst. One pass later, and Burt was eight for eight with this beam splitter to Raymond Chester, which made it competitive at 28 to 17, Jets. Not to be outdone in this pitching duel, Joe Namath targeted a football to number 88, Rich Castor, who won a foot race to the flag to ease the pressure at 35 to 17. But Burt Jones' hand was hot like no one else's has ever been last Sunday. And when his 15th completion in a row went to Lydell Mitchell, the Jets' advantage was cut to 11 points. Directly after Mr. Jones threw an NFL record of 17 consecutive completions, his luck plummeted from miraculous to miserable as number 22, Burgess Owen Stepp ballooned the Jets' lead up to 45 to 24. With 21 points to make up, Burt stayed exclusively in the air and 10 passing plays later, he backed in for yet another score. While the second-year man didn't win last Sunday, his final touchdown made it close at 45 to 38. And the 385 yards he amassed from 36 of 53 throws is certainly one of the brightest spots in the worst season of the 21-year history of the franchise. 12 defeats. Last Sunday, the Miami Dolphins rested their veterans, Pat, for the playoffs and fielded a team composed mostly of reserves against the New England Patriots. Early in that game, Tom, it appeared as though the Dolphins' strategy was going to leave them on the embarrassing side of the scoreboard. However, by game's end, the Miami Reserves had proven that they come from the same championship fiber as the regulars do. It had been a long, hard fall from possible playoff contention to non-contender. But the New England Patriots aren't without an excuse. Injuries to starting personnel, coupled with one of the league's toughest schedules, have left their Cinderella season without the glass slipper from which to sip the champagne of champions. So early against the Dolphins, number 16 Jim Plunkett set out to earn the Patriots a respectable ending to a year of frustration.
Plunkett engineered New England to the Miami three-yard line, where one of their least used plays gave them the lead. New England received a break when offensive guard John Hanna covered Plunkett's miscue in the end zone for seven points. Then the Patriots' defense forced a six-point turnover out of the usually error-free Dolphins. Number 25, John Sanders, returned Earl Morrill's throw for a second New England touchdown. And when Miami fumbled away the following kickoff, a Jim Plunkett to Mac Heron connection placed New England ahead by 21 points. It was the second quarter and 24 to nothing before Earl Morrill and the Dolphins finally began to play some football. In the 90 seconds prior to halftime, the Dolphins produced a field goal and two touchdowns, one of which came when Morrill spied rookie Melvin Baker, number 82, 37 yards downfield. Trailing by a touchdown in the third quarter, Earl Morrill went back to a good thing, number 82, Melvin Baker. Baker's second touchdown knotted the score at 24, but New England soon regained the lead on a field goal. And then the patented Dolphins comeback began to take form. The first step being provided on a long distance kickoff return by number 32 rookie Benny Malone. Miami's first lead of the day came when Don Nottingham completed a short march with a short score and added with another field goal gave the Floridians a 34 to 27 lead. But the Patriots were far from through, due mainly to their all-purpose gutsy little runner Mac Heron number 42. On a 10-yard trip around right in, Minnie Mac Heron broke the NFL record for total yards in the season held by Gale Sayers. His final sum amounted to 2,444 yards gained by rushing, pass receiving, and kick returning. Heron's heroics weren't enough to give his squad the victory, however, as the Miami Dolphins edged the New England Patriots 34-27. Things have changed a lot since Super Bowl IV when Hank Stram's offense of the 70s defeated Bud Grant's Vikings 23-7. Last week in Kansas City, one of the biggest changes was the announced retirement of one of the very best NFL players. For number 63 of the Kansas City Chiefs, last Saturday was to be the last game of his eighth and final season as one of pro football's most outstanding linebackers, leaders, and gentlemen. The Chiefs wanted it to be a day to remember and there were some pleasant moments for the Kansas City faithful. Jeff Kenny's skill as a receiver helped the Chiefs to a 6-0 lead. But for most of the afternoon, the Kansas City offense bore very little resemblance to its predecessor in Super Bowl IV. Super quick tackle Alan Page, number 88, made fast work of first Lynn Dawson and then his replacement, Dean Carlson, number nine. Just about the only real bright spot for the Chiefs came on the last play of the first half when a Fran Tarkenton rollout pass was short-circuited by cornerback Emmett Thomas, number 18. Emmett Thomas covered 73 yards to the end zone, the longest interception return of the NFL season. It was also Thomas' 12th steal, the most in the league by a wide margin. As usual, Fran Tarkenton had his conference-leading passing attack in full flight, this time featuring rookie receiver Sam McCollum, number 80. After catching only one pass in the previous 13 games, McCollum caught six against the Chiefs, two of them for touchdowns.
In the second half, Fran Tarkenton gave way to number 17, Bob Berry, who proceeded to complete 11 of 12 passes, good for two more touchdowns. The Vikings' bench strength was good enough to guarantee an easy 35 to 15 win, Minnesota's 10th victory of the season. While the victors could afford to relax, it was a time for the vanquished to reflect on the depressing thoughts that the Chiefs had finished with but five wins, their first losing season since 1963. Well, Pat, the playoff hopes of Cincinnati's coach Paul Brown were smashed by a string of injuries that left the Bengals with an almost non-existent running attack. And with league-leading quarterback Ken Anderson injured, Tom, they had to go up against the Pittsburgh Steelers last week with little hope of a passing game either. Poor Wayne Clark had the envious duty of quarterbacking the plunging Bengals against the playoff-bound Steelers. And like the rest of his team, he fared poorly. Although the Steelers did not play a strong game, they thoroughly dominated the Bengals, winning 27 to three. Rookie Lynn Swan, number 88, continued his record-breaking returns as he ended up the year with more punt return yardage than anyone else in the NFL. And it's easy to see why. With Terry Bradshaw at quarterback, the Steeler offense moved with ease through the moribund Bengal defense. And the easiest mover of them all was receiver John Stallworth, who hauled in six passes for 105 spectacular yards. Pittsburgh's first score came in the first quarter when Bradshaw connected with Stallworth in the end zone. This five-yard pass was soon followed by the old tackle eligible play as Bradshaw found number 72 tackle Jerry Mullins wide open to make it 14 to nothing. The only real drama in the game was provided by Franco Harris as he neared the magic 1,000 yard rushing mark. Harris found the moment that all runners dream about when late in the third quarter with a first and 10 at the Steeler 26, he bolted around right in for 14 yards and surpassed 1,000 yards for the season. With the playoffs in sight and a 27-3 victory, the Steelers' final regular season game, although far from perfect, was enough to ensure a 10-3-1 record, the third best in the league, and a good night's sleep. It wasn't really much of a surprise that the Steelers won the title in the AFC Central over the Bengals, Tom. You're right, Pat. I think the biggest surprise in that division, or maybe the biggest surprise in the whole league in 1974, was the inspired play of the team, which had been the worst in the NFL for two straight years. Houston's football scene had looked quite distorted, but suddenly it all came into sharp focus, thanks in good part to one of the great coaching jobs of the year by Sir Sidney Gilman. Last Sunday, the Oilers' defense was in good shape on the game's first series until Cleveland's Mike Phipps turned a third and 23 situation into a shockingly easy touchdown. Number 88, Steve Holden's touchdown had the Browns in front until the second period when a Cleveland punt was handled by most valuable Oiler, five foot nine inch rookie Billy Johnson, number 84.
Billy Johnson set the stage for a Dante Pastorini quickie to tight end Mac Alston, number 82, and the score was tied at the half. Number two, Skip Butler skipped the second half kickoff across the hard AstroTurf, and rookie Jim Romanishan, number 56, didn't quite know what to do with the ball. Dan Pastorini converted this mistake into another quick touchdown, this time to Billy Black Shoes Johnson. Johnson's score made it 14 to seven, Houston, but then another little man took over the show. Greg Pruitt's great play was canceled by a penalty, but Pruitt scored another to tie the game and then the Oilers reclaim the spotlight. Two touchdowns, one by number 34, Willie Rogers put Houston back up 28 to 17, and time was running out on the Brown. Bear Hooker scored with a minute 24 left, but it wasn't enough to save Cleveland from their 10th loss of this year, their worst season ever. As for Sid Gilman's Oilers, the 28-24 victory was their first in 10 tries against Cleveland and brought Houston its first non-losing season in five years. As one Houston player said afterward, it seems like we just won the Super Bowl because these are the guys who live through hell. Let's talk about playoff. How about Buffalo against Pittsburgh, Pat? That Steeler defense is awfully tough. I guess a lot, though, time depends on what happens with the Pittsburgh quarterback situation. I'm going to go with Buffalo. I like Pittsburgh. Okay, Washington against the L.A. Rams. We're going to be out there for that one. That should be a honey of a football mm -hmm. game, too. What do you think? I think they can pass on the Rams. I'm going to go with the Redskins. I like the Redskins, too. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you all the best action from all four of this week's playoff games. I'm Pat Summerall. I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week.